You know, we, uh, uh, I think when we launched the uh, nomination process, uh, we stated that we were uh, doing it early enough, we hope, to encourage participation in local school councils. And this is another step to encourage uh, folks to step up to the plate and, and get involved in the governance of their schools. And so uh, we do hope uh, that we can encourage uh, parents and other community members to be engaged in your, the oversight of your school through the local school council. Uh, thank you, uh, Barbara. Uh, let's see. Uh, as usual, I want to remind everybody that the board does uh, offer uh, office hours with board members, and uh, several uh, uh, people do take advantage of it. Uh, we welcome the opportunity to do it. And if you would uh, like to schedule time with board members, um, you can call 773-553-1600 uh, to make an appointment. Uh, Madam Secretary, will you please share the details for the next board meeting? Thank you, Mr. President. The next board meeting will be held on March 26, 2014. Advanced registration will open at 8 a.m. Monday, March 17, 2014, and will close on Friday, March 21, 2014 at 5 p.m., or until all slots are filled, whichever is first. If anyone has any questions about this process, please contact the board office for our assistance. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Madam Secretary. Let's now proceed with uh, today's uh, public participation. Uh, and we look forward to uh, hearing from all of you. And I'm going to start today with uh, Karen. You get your extra time <laughs> with uh, the president of the Chicago Teachers Union, Karen Lewis. Karen. Um, thank you, David. I wanted to. Um, to I mean, there's so much we could talk about: pension theft, you know, a whole lot of those things. Um, we've kind of fortunately um, moved to having some conversation, which I think is really important. I look forward to, to those meetings that for some reason just stopped happening, but I'm sure that now that you know, it clearly needs to be dealt with, that we will move forward on those in ways that don't see from our, from our retirees, especially my mother and my husband. So I'm gonna make sure you're clear about that because it just does make Thanksgiving dinner a little more difficult. Um, I also want to um, actually, I'm very impressed by the CEO's Student Advisory Council because I think that's extraordinarily important. And yesterday I want to tell you I made a school visit to a high school without a student council and without students, but not only no student voice, but also local school council, parent and teacher and community voice because those schools are on probation. Part and parcel of the fact that we're seeing a low turnout for local school councils is that parents in the community are not fooled by their lack of authority. So by having schools on probation not have fully invested local school councils, we are going to continue to see more and more apathy around that. I would like for you all to, at some point, reconsider taking away the authority of local school councils because these people asked me and they said to me that they had not had um, a, a real principal. They've only had interim principals. They have seen their school population decline from 1,700 to about 500. And along with that, some very important programs that would keep children interested in coming to school. But I do want to tell you that as I walked inside the school in the main entrance, what I saw were a lot of things that children cannot do. They cannot wear baseball caps. They cannot wear headscarves. And I thought about our Muslim sisters and sisters who would possibly fall under this. And what I saw was not a positive environment, but a very punitive environment from the moment you step into the building. I think it's important that subjectivity and flexibility be incorporated because I am afraid that if things are subjective without the appropriate training to go along with it, then we do have the problems that we see. So I'm very glad to hear that. But if something is also too rigid, then we don't have the opportunity to take into consideration extenuating circumstances for children. I'm also very concerned that data versus practice is extremely important. So I want to make sure that when we talk about data, because part of the transparency that was brought to this board, which I think is a very good first step, 
in attacking some of the real problems around um, suspensions and expulsions. We also have to remember that with charter schools, there's some other numbers that we need to look at, which are also the counseling out that actually look like suspensions and expulsions. So counseling out without quote unquote a due process has to also come into those numbers. And I think it's important. I wanna go back, I just wanna hit very strongly that creating a positive culture in our schools goes very far. But there are so many of our teachers and paraprofessionals that do not feel empowered because they have not been appropriately trained in restorative processes. This is an extremely important way to move our schools so that they become what they need to be, I still think the focus on punitive measures is still too strong. And it identifies and classifies and sorts our children in ways that it really shouldn't. So I commend the board for working further, but I am letting you know that those of us at CTU who have an interest in this are very willing to work with you to, to work on training modules for our members, but also for our parents and to work with other um, community agencies that can help us really focus on the social emotional needs of our children. Thank you. Thank you, Karen. Appreciate it. Uh, it's, my, it's my understanding that uh, uh, President Ayakola of the uh, International Union of Operating Engineers is with us today and would also like to speak to us. Uh, Bill, are you here? Bill left? Okay. Um. Thank you, Mr. President. I'll proceed with the uh, public participation list and the first individuals to be called will be um, from the Noble uh, Network. Um, speaker number 27, please, Ariana Garcia, followed by speaker number 30, Michael Thomas, and then we will proceed with speaker number two, Amy Smolensky, and then speaker number three, Allison Slade, and speaker 29, Beatriz Martinez um, from Namaste. Thank you. Ms. Garcia, last call. Moving on to speaker 30, Michael Thomas. Last call, Amy Smoslinski. Good afternoon, my name is Amy Smolenski and I have two children attending Burley Elementary. For the past eight years, I have felt certain that Burley was the right place for my sons. The outstanding teachers and administrators have created an engaging environment that encourages inquiry, curiosity, respect for others, and a love of learning. Unfortunately, providing this positive environment has become more challenging as our resources have declined nearly every year. When my children started at Burley, our school had a full-time PE teacher and a full-time art teacher. We had a reading specialist and a math specialist who worked with students that were in need of extra support. Today, we are funded for half-time PE teacher, no art, and no music teacher. Our funding no longer provides for a reading or math specialist. Our reading specialist, who had been at Burley for over 15 years, was sadly let go this year and was quickly scooped up by a magnet school that did have the funds to, for her position. CPS's annual budget bloodbath has created a toxic culture of fear and destruction, and it needs to stop. Many families have lost faith and are moving on to greener education pastures in areas that provide greater stability and stronger commitment to the classroom. I don't want to become one of these families, but I too am losing faith. Some schools are fortunate to have parent communities that are able to raise funds to bridge part of the funding gap. Most are not. The gap has grown too big and the funds continue to be depleted. A school fundraiser should be a bake sale that raises money for sports uniforms or a class trip, not a massive capital campaign to cover deficiencies and losses in fundamental music, art, and PE programming or classroom teaching positions. Ms. Noslenski, excuse me, can you please conclude? Yes. Thank this you. This year we learned of the new mandates for daily PE and additional arts instruction, programs that are much needed and have long been lacking, yet most schools don't have the funds to support these mandates. It is CPS's responsibility to increase per pupil funds to meet these new requirements in addition to all the basic educational needs of our students. 
These fundamental pieces of a well-rounded school day are necessary not only to inspire and motivate our students, but to provide them with what they need to thrive and succeed now and throughout their lives. At Burley, I can tell you that our community, the administrators, the teachers, the parents, and most of all, the students are all doing their part. It's time for CPS to do its part. The future of Burley and the future of Chicago depend on this. Thank you, Ms. Smolensky. Our you. next speaker, please. Uh, uh, Madam Secretary, if you could, just a second. It's my understanding that uh, Commissioner Reyes of the uh, Cook County Board is with us and would like to uh, speak to us. Is that true? Is Commissioner Reyes here? Was here earlier. Okay, sorry. Mr. President, if I may note, Mr. Ayacola is back in the chamber. Can he address the board? Oh, sure. Come on, Bill. Good afternoon, uh, Board of Trustees and Superintendent uh, Lord Bennett. Um, with all due respect, I'm here just to talk about the Aramark uh, contract. Um, as you know, prior to 2012, the engineers managed the custodians since 1902. So in answer to who would be accountable, there is a problem. The principals do have a lot of stress on their plate managing custodians. That problem happened only because they took it away from the engineers. My, my concern is why not give it back to the engineers? We, we managed it for over 110 years. We were accountable. There is no middleman. There is no profit. It's a baseline to the Board of Ed. I believe we would save a lot more than the $260 million that this contract's gonna cost. If every custodian was Board of Ed under the engineer, it would cost you about $180,000. So there, there's a concern that I have. Why? Yes, I'm an engineer, I'm not a custodian, and it has you know, nothing to do basically with with us, but in a way it does. The day-to-day -day operation of the school, we still feel is our responsibility to make sure that principal has the services they need every day. As you can tell by the public uh, document that was posted, over the last two years, we reduced our numbers by 150 positions. It was a hard reduction, but we were able to do it. And this was probably the coldest, snowiest winter in the last 25 years and we managed every school. Not one school had an issue with not providing the services to the students that the engineers provide. Mr. Ayacola, excuse yes. me, can okay. you please conclude? I'll conclude, I'm just concerned that this is coming too quick. Maybe it is something we have to look at, but to take all 600 schools when right now Aramark only does, as they said, Houston and Sodexo does Detroit, how come New York and Los Angeles, the two other larger school districts don't have this. I, I'm just concerned. I would just ask the board members to be very cautious when they look at this and let you know the engineers are here. We're ready, willing, and able to take back what we've done since 1902. Thank you, and I appreciate your help. Thank you, Bill. Thank you. As Ms. Slade approaches the microphone, I'd like to also call speaker number four, Mary Gruber, followed by speaker number five, Melissa Matthews, and then speaker number 16, Mary Cooper, and then speaker number six, Joy Clendenning, please. Good morning. I'm gonna let uh, my parent go first, and then I will speak. Thank you, Ms. Lane. Good morning. I am a proud parent of two students that go to Nama State Charter School. I am here concerned about the future of our school. I am here to support the five-year renewal. Sorry. I am here to support the five-year renewal, which lies in your hands for consideration today. For the past ten years, Nama State has had great success educating students, and would like to further this success with the next five years, partnering with the Chicago Board of the Chicago Public Schools is in second grade with third grade reading and math. My first grader, and she struggled with reading. And the teacher noticed and right away advised me to take her to after school tutoring and gave me some tutoring techniques I could use at home. Now she's in first grade reading level and ex excels in mathematics. Every child learns different. Namaste finds creative ways to help students get excited about learning. This past week, my student, my daughter was named student of the week. I want the same opportunity 
for my daughter who will be entering kindergarten this fall. I found Namaste while looking for an alternative school for my district, for the school pertaining to my district. Namaste is 10 points higher in reading and science, five points higher in mathematics. I am so proud I have a choice for my daughters. All parents want the best for their children. Namaste Charter School is not just a school. It's friends, family, parents, community. We are all community in this school. Ms. Martinez, excuse me. I am asking, yes. Can you please conclude? Yes. Thank you. I am asking you to secure the future of the school and the education of my daughters. Thank you for your consideration, and I welcome you to visit, visit Namaste Charter School anytime. And these are the pictures. <laughs> <laughs> these are my girls. Good. These are the future. Thank you, Ms. Martinez. Thank you very much. We look forward to seeing you. Thank you. Uh, oh, thank you. Allison. Good morning. Um, and thank you so much for your time today. Uh, for those of you who don't know me, I'm Allison Slade. I'm the founder and principal at Namaste. 11 years ago, I had the pleasure of standing before you pleading for the chance to start our small school in McKinley Park, dedicated to implementing and sharing a groundbreaking educational model that combines health and wellness with academic rigor in a peaceful environment. After 10 years, I'm proud to report that Namaste has always remained at the top of the elementary schools in the city. Every single year since our opening, we have outperformed our comparison school, where our students would have gone if they didn't have the opportunity to attend Namaste. Um, we serve a population which is 85% low income, 90% minority, 30% English language learner, and 20% diverse learners. For 10 years, we have worked hard not only to build our successful institution, but to work effectively with and for the Chicago Public Schools in helping you, Jesse, learn from our successes and even our failures. Uh, to improve educational outcomes for students both at Namaste and across the city. We stand here today excited about what the future holds for Namaste as part of the Chicago Public Schools. As we have always done, however, it is important to recognize and learn from the challenges we have faced in this renewal process, which has caused us some deep concern. The lack of adherence to timelines presented, inconsistent communication, and the expectation that we negotiate a contract in a week's time has presented us with some concerns in our five-year renewal period that is upcoming. I welcome the opportunity to help you learn from our experiences and to help refine and reconstruct the renewal process. Ms. Slade, excuse me, can you please conclude? Yes. Thank you. So that is minimally invasive to the high-quality work that we are doing on a day-to-day -day basis. A partnership works both ways, and we are hopeful that the value that we add to, to the Chicago Public Schools is recognized and valued today. And I just want to point out that we just passed Valentine's Day, and my kids write Valentine's to all of our supporters, so I brought one for each of you. You should have it. Thank you, Alice. David, and I David <laughs> may I add something? Uh, I am a little bit biased here because uh, Allison has been my former student, excellent student at the National Lewis University. <laughs> but I, I do want to say that I conduct sometimes classes in neighborhood schools, and you are one of the charters where we've had classes where all the teachers who are in the program could learn from the good things happening. Thank you. We'll help you. Thank you. Our next speaker, please, Mary Gruber. Hello. My name is Mary Katie Gruber, and I have two boys at Ray Elementary in Hyde Park. Ray is a great place. It has terrific teachers, and if you stick around to play or chat after school, you quickly get a sense of the strong community there. Ray is also culturally, racially, and socioeconomically diverse. Last week, my pre-K son told me that for his next birthday, he wants to invite I love it. Ray is in transition, however. Because it has added seventh grade due to the elimination of this grade at nearby Cantor Middle School. Next year, Ray is expecting to add eighth grade as well. The staff at Ray is in transition too, due to decreases in the budget over the past years. We are thrilled that the board is asking schools to offer daily PE and additional arts instruction. We know that physically active children and children who engage in the arts make happier, better students. Staffing additional PE and arts classes requires more funding, however, because Ray doesn't have any cushion. There's nothing to cut. 
This past year, we had to choose between an art teacher and a music teacher. Our foreign language department has been cut in half in recent years, and we have lost aids for classrooms and for individual students who need them. District schools need an increase in <coughs> per pupil funding so that we can staff the PE and arts classes that the board has mandated. The board has taken a good first step in providing a vision of the kind of schools that parents like me want to send their children to. Now we need to focus on the successful implementation of that vision. The future of Ray and the future of Chicago depend on this. Thank you, Ms. Green. Thank you. Our next speaker, please, Melissa Matthews. Last call. Moving on to the next speaker, please, Mary Cooper. The next speaker then will be speaker number six, Joy Clendenning. I would like to note that Andrew Roy uh, will not address the board today. And the next speaker then will be speaker 14, Allison Jack, followed by speaker number eight, Jennifer Garat, nine, Carmen Rodriguez, number 10, Karen Convery, and then speaker 24, Eleanor Griffith, please. Go ahead, Joy. Okay, um, good morning. I'm Joy Clendenning, I'm a CPS parent. Three of my children attend Kenwood Academy. Kenwood is a neighborhood high school with some special programs and is known for working with all students to be successful in getting to and completing college. Something exciting that just happened at Kenwood is that the amazing Latin language teacher took a delegation of over 30 students to the Illinois Junior Classical League, a statewide academic competition, and the Kenwood group came home with a fifth place trophy that's in this state. This is an example of teachers who believe in the potential of all students. Despite this kind of hard work and dedication on the part of the Kenwood staff, students, and families, Kenwood faced cuts of over $1 million last spring. Kenwood students now wait in long lines to enter school early in the morning because there's not enough security to open up more lines. After school, parts of the building must be closed so that at least some events, such as basketball games, can go on. The counseling staff, a vital component of support for students, was cut so that already unmanageable loads became even worse. These are just a few examples. There have always been trade-offs at Kenwood, and now there are more. Kenwood cannot be cut anymore. The board is asking high schools to have four years of PE for all students. This is a good goal, but the funding that CPS has allocated to schools does not even meet the basic educational needs of our students. There's nothing left to cut in our school, so how will we pay the increased expense of providing four years of PE? Ms. Clendenning, excuse me, can you please conclude? Yes, I will. Thank so you. So this is why um, you, the Board of Education, you must find us an increase in per pupil funding for our district schools so that our children can receive this well-rounded school day with adequate staff and supports. The future of Kenwood and the future of Chicago depend on this. Thank you, Ms. Clendenning. Our next speaker, please, Allison Jack. Hello. I am Allison Jack. I'm Director of Growth and Support at the Illinois Network of Charter Schools. Um, you'll, you'll be voting today on the recommended renewal of four charter schools, Noble, Namaste, Providence, Inglewood, and the Chicago Math and Science Academy. I'm very familiar with the approval and renewal processes of charter schools because I used to work here about a decade ago. Um, since 2003, over 10,000 schools have grad 10,000 students have graduated from Chicago Charter High Schools, most of whom have gone on to college and many of whom have come back to work in their, in their very schools. When I was here, it was a much different time, um, both politically and financially, but then and now, it is the job of the Office of New Schools to hold schools strictly accountable for student achievement, but also to preserve their freedom to operate, innovate, and meet the needs of every family. 
We applaud CPS staff for recognizing the excellent work that these schools are doing in their communities, and we urge the board to vote for their renewal. The renewal process needs to ensure that CPS can have all the data and all the information they need to make these important decisions, but it also should be fair and clear and as least bureaucratic as possible. This year, unfortunately, the process didn't exactly happen like that. Allison Slade talked a little bit about that. Um, the schools face missed deadlines, unclear directives. The office also refused to negotiate around certain points of the contract, including one that allows CPS to give the schools only one day of notice if they're going to change a term of their accountability agreement, which seems a little egregious to me. The charter schools need fair, clear, and transparent compliance and recording, reporting requirements so that they can do the important work they need to do, which is educating students. INC stands ready to work with the Office of New Schools to ensure an, a rigorous and efficient renewal process for next year. Uh, we urge the board and the Office of New Schools to think of charter schools as partners as you ensure that every family in the city ha can find the right school for their child. I finished before she said something, so I wanted to add a little story. I was, <laughs> I was just going to ask you to conclude, Miss Allison Jack. I, Thank you. Real, I was practicing my remarks last night, so I would be good. And my babysitter's boyfriend came over, and she heard me talking about charter schools. And she said, I went to a charter school. And I said, oh. And he went to Pre Perspectives at Calumet, and he got a full-ride scholarship for football to all of Olivet Nazarene. And he is now doing military intelligence for the Air Force. So I was very excited to meet him. Thank you, Ms. Thank Jack. You. Thank you. Our next speaker, please, speaker number eight, Jennifer Girat. Good morning. My name is Jennifer Garrett. I am a CPS graduate, a parent of three CPS students, and a parent rep on the LSC at Bern Elementary. Let me tell you about some positive things that are happening at Bern, a neighborhood school. We have two championship volleyball teams and have developed our first student internship with a local business. And our Battle of the Books teams qualified for the citywide competition for the first time last year. Now let me tell you about some negative things that are happening at Bern. Our budget this year was cut $400,000, which meant we lost three aides, one teacher, and a bilingual coordinator. We have never had a language class. We have art, but no music. Art class is 45 to 60 minutes a week, depending on the grade. It is not two hours of art per week. It has never been two hours of art per week. And I'm fascinated slash horrified to watch how it will ever become two hours of art per week when we have been given no sustainable funding for it. The board is asking schools to have daily PE and additional arts instruction, good, but the funding that CPS has allocated to schools does not even meet the students' basic educational needs. There's nothing left to cut at burn. And how does this fit into the day? To awkwardly borrow a phrase, you're trying to fit 10 pounds of instruction into a five pound day, while not even funding the bag itself. It seems to me that our city's administration intends to make its mark with a longer school day, touting this two hours of art class and so on, as if a press release news soundbite equals the truth. Meanwhile, parents stand open mouths with exasperation, throwing their hands up in the air because they know the truth about what is being funded at their schools, and principals are forced to make Sophie's choice decisions about curriculum. How can we fit art and PE into our day and budget? Multitasking? Perhaps students can artfully sort their food into color groups during lunch. No extra staff necessary for that. Perhaps we'll count PE as the time it takes students to walk to classes between the maid building and the decaying mobile units. Ms. Garrett, excuse me, can you please conclude? Sure. Thank Those you. Those were jokes, but not far off from the other ideas that CPS has actually pushed, like online PE and art, or PE in the hallways outside of in-use classrooms. District schools need an increase in per pupil funding so that children can receive a well-rounded school day with adequate staff and supports to thrive. The future of Bern and the future of Chicago depend on this. Thank, Thank you, you Ms. Garrett. Our next speaker, please, Carmen Rodriguez. Last call for Carmen Rodriguez. Moving on to the next speaker, please. Speaker number 10, Karen Convery, followed by speaker 24, Eleanor Griffith, and then speaker number 11, Andrew Kaplan, followed by speaker 12, Queen's sister, and then the designated speaker for Canty, please, speaker number 13, Frank Pelosi. Good afternoon, my name is Karen Lee and my son is currently a first grader attending Audubon, the neighborhood school in Roscoe Village. 
In 2011, Audubon was named a National Blue Ribbon School, and through the commitment and support of Audubon parents, local businesses, and the Roscoe Village community, we have been able to enhance the academic experience of all of our students. Last year, we were informed as parents that the Audubon budget was being cut by 400,000, forcing the loss of teachers in the classroom, the loss of art and music, and vital administrative support. Thanks to the Friends of Audubon, an organization created to privately raise money to enhance the academic experience of neighborhood children, we were able to save art and music. Without that support from FOA last year, Audubon would today be a very different school. This year, FOA has substantially increased the need for fundraising and has turned to the parent community to increase their giving. It is imperative that we all realize, however, that the majority of CPS schools cannot raise hundreds of thousands of dollars to provide the basic mandates from CPS. How sustainable is it to continue to ask parents to help bridge the budget deficit gap from CPS? Now we are being informed that the board is asking schools to have daily PE and additional arts instruction. These are goals that certainly are good in the long-term future. However, the current funding that CPS has allocated to Audubon and all other schools does not even meet the basic educational needs of our students. I am here today to tell you that there is nothing left to cut at Audubon. It is imperative that all district schools receive an increase in per pupil funding so that all of our children can and will receive a well-rounded, well-deserved school day with adequate staff to support a thriving environment. Today I stand before you representing not only my son, but as well every other student at Audubon and every other student enrolled within CPS. Thank you so much. Thank you, Ms. Convery. Our next speaker, please. Three times a year, our eighth grade class is told that we will, we will be taking the NWEA. Three times a year, we prepare for it. We make flashcards and we go on the NWEA website to look up commonly seen terms on the test. Three times a year, we take the test and see absolutely nothing that we expected. Teachers spend hours readying us for a test that affects their ratings and our future, but it's impossible to study for. So taking the NWEA test is very stressful. Sometimes you get high school level questions. Why are teachers and schools ratings being jeopardized because we're being tested on stuff we're not supposed to have learned? But they are, so teachers put a lot of emphasis on our scores and meeting our goals. They try to give us an incentive to do better next time by doing award ceremonies for most improved and best score. And then classmates ask what scores you got on the test. If you don't do as well as your friends, it's really embarrassing. People think that when we get higher scores on the NWEA that we're actually growing and learning. It's good to set goals for students, but it should be teachers doing it, not computers. The truth is, our goal score in the NWEA could be just the difference of guessing on a single question or not. Multiple choice tests don't measure your work ethic, your ability to retain knowledge, how well you work with other students, your thought, or anything your teachers really need to teach you better. But NWEA determines what goals you have, what classes you take, our teachers and our school's ratings, and now even whether we get into a selective enrollment high school. For it to have all these effects on our academic lives, it should measure other things as well, but it doesn't. The worst part is, NWEA is not the only standardized test eighth graders take. Ms. Griffith, excuse me, can you please conclude? Yes. Thank you. Um, there's also ISAT, high school admissions tests, the Constitution tests, and the algebra exit exam. In conclusion, I know educators mean the best by having us take NWEA, but in reality, they can't really know the effect on students because they never experience standardized testing to this extent as kids. NWEA is changing the idea of school for the worse. Instead of being places of meaningful learning, schools are becoming places of stressful testing. If we need to have standardized tests, please do not use NWEA or multiple choice tests like it, and please just use one standardized test one time a year. Thank you. Our next speaker, please. Our next speaker, Andrew Kaplan. Hello. Good, af good afternoon. Uh, thank you all for your service. I appreciate it. My name's Andrew Kaplan. I'm here with Natalie Sternberg. We're both parent members of the LSC, and the following statement has been uh, reviewed by our whole LSC. Uh, good morning. We're parent representatives of the local school council at Mitchell, which is a neighborhood open enrollment school located in West Town. We're a small school by design with 361 students. In 2003, our student growth and achievement have been far above average, 
and we're predicted to be a tier one school next year. Our small size enables teachers to provide an innovative and individualized curriculum for all students. This year, with the switch to per pupil funding, our budget was cut by 23%. As a result, Mitchell lost our full school day position, librarian, and a bilingual teacher. While the use of carryover funds for the year prior enabled us to avoid deeper cuts to our staffing structure, looking ahead, we are very concerned. Assuming that our funding levels remain the same and without any more carryover funds, which don't appear to exist, we will face unacceptable choices that will impact our ability to provide a quality education at Mitchell. So we ask you guys to do, we ask you all to do what is right to help Mitchell specifically and our Chicago community as a whole. That is increased per pupil funding for all students. Reaffirm the importance of neighborhood schools. To achieve this, we suggest a critical review of areas that receive budget increases in the, uh, this year, including men many central office departments. We ask that you scrutinize every CPS contract to see if it directly benefits students and teachers. We recognize that fund finding additional revenue is a must. A CPS that becomes more efficient and delivers more dollars to schools directly helps bolster the argument of those in our community. Mr. Kaplan, excuse me, yes, can you please you. conclude? Thank you. Thank you who are pushing to establish a more progressive tax code in Illinois, very important. Please give us some breathing room so all Chicago children can thrive. The future of Mitchell and the future of our city depend on the education we provide. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Kaplan. As our next speaker approaches Queen Sister, followed by Speaker 13, Frank Pelosi, the next speaker then uh, will be Speaker number 15, Brenda Delgado, and I'd like to note that Speaker number 17 will not address the board uh, today, uh, followed by Speaker 19, Joshua Friedland, Speaker 20, Victoria Bryant, and then Speaker number 22, Wendy Canton. Last call for Queen Sister. Moving on to speaker 13, please. Frank Pelosi. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen of the board. My name is Frank Pelucci. I'm a parent member of Canty's LSC. Today, rather than stand here and yet again recite the data, statistics, and facts of Canty's overcrowding, we've decided to read a letter from a local politician uncovered during our research of Canty's 15-year saga. This letter was sent to CEO Arnie Duncan is dated October 15, 2004, six years after our initial request for an addition. Dear Mr. Duncan, I am writing to you to recommend Arthur E. Canty Elementary School as a top priority among Chicago public schools for the construction of an addition to accommodate its expanding number of students. On a recent visit to Canty, I learned that its population has expanded from 364 students in 1991 to the current enrollment of 577 students. Today we are at 828. Despite the addition of four modular classrooms, the school's 33 teachers are providing instructions in 26 classrooms. Principal Michael, Con uh, Michael Conley believes that with continuing influx of young families to the neighborhood, there is a sustained need for an additional space at Canty. It's been my pleasure to visit several Chicago public schools over the past few years, and I continue to be impressed by the students, teachers, and administrations, administrators I meet. Thank you for your work in providing excellent opportunities in education for Chicago students. Sign, Rahm Emanuel, Member of Congress. Well, I can assure you, the current board, and the mayor that the situation at Canty has not improved in 10 years. So I'm asking you, the board, to go back and ask yourselves and the mayor, is this the year that Canty gets an addition? If this letter was written by just another politician placating his constituents to get garner votes, Mr. then the answer Pelusi? is going to be no. Mr. Pelusi, excuse me. Can you please conclude? Sure. Thank you. But if that letter that I have just read was written by a future mayor who truly believes in his mantra that it's for the children, then your answer will be yes. Thank you. Thank you. Brenda Delgado, please. Speaker 15. Brenna Delgado Ailes, parent of three CPS students, LSC parent member of Ruben Salazar. Per people funding levels are inadequate to provide a high quality, well-rounded school day in an equitable ma manner across the city of Chicago. Dollars need to follow the student into the classroom where instruction happens. The future of Chicago depends on the future of its public schools. Classrooms should be the last place to cut. Salazar has nothing left to cut. 
per crane, Chicago spends more than any other large urban district on general administrative costs. Parent budget analysts found central office spending increased $178 million this school year. This is $508 per pupil. For a school with 600 students, that would equal $309,000. While a list of non-funded mandates keeps growing, PE, recess, arts, music, all which we are thrilled about, but terrified how it's gonna be non-funded. If CO maintained spending at 2010 levels, nearly every school could hire an additional arts or PE teacher. Classrooms should be the last place to cut. Two of my three children attend Ruben Salazar, a small bilingual school of 400 students with over 80% free and reduced lunch. At 150% utilized, Salazar accepts students from all over the city, no admissions testing, many ELLs, over 15% special ed. Some enter kindergarten or even seventh grade, years behind their peers. Salazar's dedicated teachers get them to grade level, sometimes two or even three grade level improvements in one single year. Their formula works. What is it? They offer after school tutoring. They reduce class size. They used reading and math interventionists. They have nine nationally certified teachers. But they had to cut both of those interventionist positions this year due to dismal per pupil funding. Ms. Delgado, excuse Thank me. Thank you. This year, teachers do their own RTI, but how can they do that when they're teaching 26 to 32 students? Salazar parents can't fundraise to, do the, to make up the difference. With advice from our neighbor across the street, Walter Payton, Friends of Peyton helped us establish Amigos de Salazar last year, where 34 families contributed and we raised $1,700. Thank you, Mr. Walter Mr. Payton Pena. raised $300,000. We cannot make up the difference. We need CPS to fund public schools today. Thank you, Ms. Delgado. Our next speaker, please, Jasha Friedland. Good afternoon. Members of the Board of Education, I'm Joshua Friedland, the chair of the local school council for Jamison Elementary and a parent of our first and fourth grader. With me is Bianca Govan and Deb Garcia of the PAC. Jamison is a successful tier one neighborhood school serving over 900 pre-kindergarten through eighth grade students. Jamison is very proud of our student achievement and staff dedication. This year, the Illinois State Board of Education awarded Ms. Valdez, one of our kindergarten te teachers, the Outstanding Early Career Educator Award. Other members of our staff have chipped in and organized new vibrant and rich after-school arts programs. Like other neighborhood schools, last year's budget cuts have harmed our students. Mid-year, we were able to reestablish our music program only as a result of increased enrollment and reducing supply costs, including technology. We lost two bilingual positions and are left with a single dedicated bilingual teacher to teach our 180 ELL students. 15 teachers are getting their ESL certification to help fill the void created by these cuts. In addition, Jamison's facilities remain inadequate as recently discussed with Vice President Ruiz. Our classrooms are overcrowded as a result of the budget cuts. Our three fourth grade classes have an enrollment of over 35 students and our second grade classes have enrollment over 28 students. These excessive classroom populations make our commitment to success an incredible challenge. Teacher dedication is outstanding at Jamison and student achievement is strong, but increased enrollment coupled with an inadequate per pupil funding does not allow us to increase our teaching staff to meet student needs or relieve overcrowding. This overcrowding coupled with an unsafe facility is inadequate. Mr. Friedland, excuse me, can you please conclude? Yep. Thank you. We, we support daily physical education and additional arts education, but without an increase in per pupil funding, these requirements could lead to additional cuts in classroom teachers and a further increase in classroom sizes. Schools need an increase in per pupil funding so that our children can receive a well-rounded school day with adequate staff, resources, and facilities to thrive. The future of Jamison and the future of Chicago depend on this. Thank you, Mr. Friedland. And our next speaker, please, Victoria Bryant. Hi, my name is Victoria Bryant, and I'm a parent of a third grader at Burr Elementary. Budgets, re budgets reflect priorities. Equity is what we were told per people funding was going to create. It hasn't and won't achieve that goal. First, the per pupil amount is too low and is forcing schools to choose between awful and really awful choices. 40 plus kids per class or reading interventionist art 
and at Burr, we had to cut our art program, and we also lost our uh, a Japanese language teacher. We're a Japanese magnet school. We have one teacher to teach 354 kids. They used to have it every day. They have it maybe uh, an hour a week. Or a special ed assistant. Not real choices. Schools with staff and or parents with fundraising skills fare better. Those with parents who can volunteer fare better. This is not equity. All schools should be fully funded out. Fully funded. Outside funds shouldn't be providing stated priorities for CPS. Arts instruction is one example. The last place cut should occur is in the classroom. And unfortunately for CPS, that seems to be one of the first places that is cut. There should be funding that allows every school to have appropriately sized classes, art, language, PE, et cetera, regardless of what type of school or how much parents or school staff can raise. Thank you. <laughs>